Pivot tables is one of the most common Excel feature you would see used, but with the release of these two new functions, group by and pivot by, does it mean that it is finally time to say goodbye to pivot tables? Well, in this video, I'm going to show you how you can use Excel's group by and pivot by functions to make things similar to a pivot table and the advantages and disadvantages of each. In the left side of the worksheet, I have a range of data that's related to the supplies being sold, and we'll only be focusing on the columns for category, location, and unit price. If our boss came to us one day and asked us to find the total unit price for each category, then we can use a simple pivot table to accomplish that. In this range of cell here, I already inserted the pivot table, and all we have to do is just drag the appropriate column to the rows and values section. So I can just drag category here, and then I can drag the unit price column into the value section. And we get the total unit price by category in this pivot table. But with Excel's group by function, we can accomplish the same thing. In this cell, I'm going to do equals to group by. And while typing end out, you'll get the description aggregate values by row fields. I do tab, and we'll be met with these three mandatory arguments here, row fields, values, and functions, and the optional arguments, which I'll go for more later. So the row fields represents the category that we're trying to aggregate by which in this case are the values for books, electronics, furniture, and stationaries. So I'm just going to select all the values in column C here, including the header info, comma, the values we're trying to aggregate by, which is the unit price. So I'm going to select all the data here, including the header info, comma, and the function that we want to apply. In this case, like, do we want to find the maximum value, the average, the sum? And we're given a lot of options here but in our case we're only doing a sum so i'm going to do tab and then if i close this out and press enter we get back all the data here similar to what you'd see in this pivot tables the only thing you'll notice that's missing is the header info and if we want to include the header info since we reference the column headers in our range we can do comma and we'll be given the field header arguments here where we can put in zero for no Ergo, like the data we selected did not have headers, and we don't want to show the header info. The data we selected has headers, but we don't want to show it. The data we selected does not have any headers, but we want to generate header info instead. And three, which is the data we selected has headers, but we want to show it as well, which will apply to our scenario right now. So if I do three and press enter, we get back the header information of category and unit price. It's very important to remember that when you are selecting your data, for row fields and values, you want to keep the length of each range the same. So when you are selecting the data for row fields and start at row 1 and end at row 21, then the data you select for values should also start at row 1 and end at row 21. In a real life situation, your manager might ask to show the percentage of each category as the grand total in the next column. So in a pivot table, the way you would do that is by dragging the same unit price in the value section and then you can just click here go to value field settings and just show values as percent of grand total and you get the percentage for each category here using the group by function the way you can do this is that you can use two functions first being the h stack function and the third argument which is the function argument h stack parentheses the array one will just be sum by itself comma and the array 2 will be the percent of function, which you can see here. And if I do a tab and no parentheses, and then I just do a close parentheses to close out the h stack function, press enter, we get back the unit price here and the percentage in the next column. And if you just want to format it, you can just select the data here, select this as a currency, and select the percentages. And you'll see that we have the headers here unit price and unit price. Now that looks pretty weird, so we can fix that by just stating in the field headers argument that we don't want to show anything here. And we get back the column and just the sum and the percent of headers instead. What if you want you to group by two columns instead of one? Ergo, we want to group by the category first and then the location next based on the unit price value. Well, what we can do is that we can go back to the original function and let's just do it based on sum instead of percent of. So I'm going to modify the third argument here to include only sum. 
And in the first argument for row fields, I'm going to modify this so that it includes the values in column D as well as column C. And this should work assuming that the columns are next to each other. So I'm going to change this to D21 and it'll reference both columns this time. I'm going to leave this alone. And the next thing I want to do is that I want to include the headers as well. Since we're including the headers in our range, we want to change this from like a zero to three where we want to like show the header and we included them before. And in our previous example with the percent of, I mentioned that you want to include zero to like not show the header, but the actual correct number would be one. We included the header in our range, but we don't want to show them. So I'm going to press enter and we get back the category column here, the location column and the unit price. And let's just clean this up with the formatting. I'll format this as a currency. And you'll notice that there's multiple categories this time since there's multiple locations. We have categories for books for Florida, which is $15. The same category for books for all these prices in Ohio, $18. For electronics, we have a cumulated value of $2150 for New York and so on and so on. What if you wanted to show the subtotal for each category based on location? Well, in the next argument, we have the total death argument, which is an optional one. And you have the option to add in zero for no totals, one for grand totals, two for grand add subtotals, negative one for grand totals at top, and negative two for grand and subtotals at top. And if we wanted to include the grand and subtotals, we can enter in two. And we get these additional rows here that shows the subtotal for all the books categories here, $33, and then electronics, and then furniture and then stationary along with the grand total. If we want to put the grand total on the top, well, what we can do is that instead of two, we could enter the number for negative one. Um, well, that's positive one. So I'm just going to change that back to like negative one. And this time we have the grand total right below the row headers for both grand total and subtotals at the top. We can do negative two instead. And the formatting of this changes a bit as well. The grand totals here and all the subtotals are right above the locations. The next optional argument will allow us to sort the data. For this argument, you would type out a number, and this number would represent the column number from your selected row fields. A positive number will sort the data in ascending order, while a negative value will sort it in descending order. To show how this works, I'm going to go back to the function and change this negative 2 to a 1 for the total depth argument. That way, I only show the grand totals so that the subtotal doesn't become confusing when doing the sort. So press enter, and now we get the grand total only. And to actually sort the value based on the selected column, or based on the given column, I'm going to do a comma. And if we want to sort by unit price from in ascending order, we can put in the value of 3 for the third column here. Press enter. And we get back all the unit price from smallest to greatest. If we want to do it from highest to lowest, excluding the grand total, we can do negative uh, we can do negative 3 instead in the function and we get the largest number of 2720 and the smallest number here with the total not being affected here so let's say you wanted to do a different column instead what if you wanted to do the location well you can put in 2 since location is in the second column and this would sort alphabetically based on each category and location so we have the categories for books here and we have it from in ascending order from Florida to Ohio, and if for electronics, since California, the letter C comes before F, then F comes before N, and then the letter N comes before O. And then we move on to the next category, and it does the same thing again. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you guys is how to filter based on a single criteria. So in the function, we can do a comma, and we have access to this argument filter array. And I'm going to reference the cells in column C for category. And let's say that we want to filter by a certain category like electronics. What we can do is that we can reference the cells and do equals to and type out electronics. Close this out with a quote and press enter. And we get back all the values for electronics only. If we want to do something else like books, we can type out books or even reference another cell that reference book directly as a text. And we get this. But if we wanted to do everything that's not books, or we want our data to be filtered for everything not equal to books, we can use the not equal to symbol here. Press enter. And you won't see any data related to books here now. Now you're not limited by the not equal to symbol or the equal to symbol either. 
If you want to filter based on values or numbers, you can use the greater than sign or the less than sign as well. Now, what if we want to filter by locations? Well, we can just change this C1 to C21 into D1 to D21. And we can say that if we want all the values for New York only, we can just type out New York directly here, press enter. And we get, well, we get all the values where the data is not equal to New York now. But if we wanted New York, we can do equals to symbol here. And now we get the values for New York. The last function I want to show you guys is the pivot by function. And the pivot by function is very similar to group by function and is pretty easy to use. In cell H9, I'm going to type out equals to pivot by and we get the description aggregates values by rows and columns. I'm going to do tab and we get a bunch of arguments, both mandatory and optional. And for this example, we're just going to focus on the first four mandatory arguments only. So for the row fields argument, we just want to select the data that will act as our row in a table. So in this case, we're going to select categories since we want to show the rows for each category and then comma and the column fields is the opposite of row fields. We want to select the values that we're going to show columns for in the table. So we're going to choose the locations as our call fields, comma. The values are the things we're trying to aggregate by. So we're going to choose unit price again. And then the function is going to be the aggregate function that we want to use. Do we want to sum up the value, find the average percent of? In this case, we're just going to do sum. And then if I close this out and press enter, we get back a table that shows the locations as columns and the category says rows and all the unit prices here are the aggregated sums. If there is no sum, then it's just going to return a blank as we can see in this value here or in the cell here. Now you might be wondering why use a pivot by function and a group by function over a pivot table and vice versa. Well, whenever we update a value in the source table, we have to manually refresh it in the pivot table. So let's say that I change this unit price to 100,000. And when I do that, the values in the functions gets updated automatically. But in a pivot table, you can either do a right click and do a refresh, or you can like just refresh it in the one of the tabs here. But I'm going to do click on refresh here and the values gets updated that way. So you'd have to update it manually every time. The cool thing with pivot tables is that you can easily make a dynamic dashboard out of it. With these dynamic dashboards, you can visually show the data in the form of pivot charts connected to pivot tables. Then filter your data with pivot slicers and timelines. If you're interested in seeing how this works, then check out this video where I show how you can make a dynamic dashboard in Excel with pivot tables and charts. With that said, I hope you guys found this video to be helpful. And if you did, like and comment down below what else you'd want to see. And if you haven't already, subscribe. Until then, I'll see you guys next time.